good evening this is uh, subhash gatade and welcome you all to the 26th lecture in the democracy dialogue series a conversation uh, we started uh, during the pandemic uh, basically to to understand uh, paradox with that how with deepening of democracy why majority and forces seem to be going on ascendant so that has been one of the one of our key concerns behind this uh, democracy dialogue and leading intellectuals and activists have uh, joined and ad have found time to address this meeting this evening uh, professor mrudula mukherjee uh, will be enlightening us about uh, uh, the, the, the debate about nehru which is being raised con continuously professor mukherjee doesn't need any introduction but still some few details should uh, be bit, bit better shared with all, all the rest of the audience audience she has been a professor of modern indian history at jawarla nehru university and she was a director of uh, nehru memorial museum library and she has many books to her credit uh, ranging from uh, the colonizing uh, agriculture and peasants in india's non violent revolution and she has co-authored few books with professor vipin chandra professor aditya mukherjee and professor suchi sucheta mahajan india's struggle for independence and india after independence and rss school text and murder of gandhi uh, the the first book which i mentioned india's struggle for independence has has sold around 8 lakh copies when when i learned that, that was the last count i i, I read, read about it so but apart from this uh, this formal introduction she is one of the leading voices today for the last 9 and 10 years uh, against the uh, redeems attempt to distort and distort india independence struggles history and also stigmatize the leading leaders of uh, our, our uh, independence struggle and the main target of their attack has been nehru so today professor mukherjee will be telling us about what the title of her presentation is who is afraid of jawarlal nehru so friends please welcome professor mudula mukherjee thank you thank you shall i begin okay please okay Well, thank you uh, very much uh, for this uh, invitation, and uh, I'm uh, very, very happy to be able to participate in this series, which I've been following many of your lectures, and I think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, you're beginning this democracy dialogues and enabling all of us to listen to a very fine uh, group of uh, intellectuals and uh, uh, public uh, in. Uh, persons over the now i think this has been going on for almost 2 years if i'm not uh, mistaken and uh, it's why it's a real honor for me to be invited to this and participate in this thank you very much uh, uh as i uh, said in the short note that i uh, sent out uh, about my talk uh you know there is this paradox which we are faced with that in his lifetime jawarlal nehru was recognized the world over as a statesman and an indian leader second only to gandhi ji he was a for foremost leader of the freedom struggle who gave it a decided socialist orientation and he remained unrivaled as prime minister after independence and built the solid foundations of a sovereign secular democratic and egalitarian republic he evolved the concept of non alignment which enabled many ex colonial countries to avoid becoming a part of the two power blocks engaged in the cold war however he is today the favorite whipping boy of the establishment we are told he was responsible for the partition of india for the mess in kashmir for the death of subhash bose for delaying the integration of hyderabad and of goa for the defeat at the hands of china in 
for neglecting agriculture and primary education and much else. The reason for the defamation is, of course, that he stood for the exact opposite of what is being valued today. His life and work present and will continue to present a continuous question mark to the regressive trends which are now in fashion. This will become evident as we focus in this talk, especially on two areas of great relevance today in which we are facing a grave crisis. One, democracy and civil liberties, and the other, communalism stroke secularism. We will also focus some attention given uh, the, you know, given how much time we have on Nehru's evolving understanding of Mahatma Gandhi's vision and method of nonviolent struggle, of which he became the most ardent advocate after Gandhiji's death. So, you know, as you, as, as uh, Subhashji just said, we've been having very loud debates uh, over history uh, for the last many years now. Names are changed, street names are changed, uh, road names, colonies. You know, we have debates about whether the Taj Mahal was Tejo Mahal or built by, uh, it was a Hindu temple. I mean, all kinds of ludicrous debates are also there. And these are very loud and visible and often go on in the on the TV screens. But at the same time, there is a less audible but equally significant war that is being waged. And I'll give you an example. Most people don't even know about it. Uh, quietly, the Indian Council for Historical Research has been engaged in an exercise to revise a list of the heroes of the freedom struggle. This was a kind of directory of the heroes of the freedom struggle, which was put together about a decade or more ago with great uh, care and love uh, by uh, many, many research scholars engaged all over the country and the chairman himself, Professor Bhattacharya, taking a lot of interest in it. And the idea was to have somewhere a whole list of people who had sacrificed uh, and mart got martyred in the freedom struggle. Now, quietly, uh, what they did was, as a part of this exercise, they brought out a poster announcing a lecture series commemorating 75 years of independence. And the wonderful thing was that on this poster, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru's name was missing from a collage of freedom fighters that was there on this poster. And who was there? Of course, the current favorite, Savarkar. It's just a couple of small examples of how this thing happens away from the public eye. Sometimes it gets noticed. We people talk about it amongst ourselves. It never makes it, uh, often doesn't make it to a newspaper or TV debate, you know. Of course, the, what is going on at the level of the changes in the textbooks, uh, we all know about. But, uh, you know, some of the best uh, ret uh, sort of vitriol in this ongoing war, and most of this ongoing war that I'm talking about happens at uh, in, in, the, in the social media domain, especially in the WhatsApp uh, territory. And here Jawaharlal Nehru uh, has been particularly a target of attack. Many of you would know, but many of you may not also know uh, about the extent to which he is vilified. There were, I discovered a few months ago that there was a site, a website, uh, which was titled Dismantling Nehru. And, uh, and it also referred to Jawal, Jawal, Dismantling Nehru, the last viceroy of India. And then there was a, this had a series of posts some of them very well researched on different uh, aspects of what was wrong with Nehru. And it, it like, I mean, there was a whole list of stuff and, you know, they've taken care to put in a lot of very critical material. For some reason, two or three weeks ago, it has uh, disappeared. Don't know. 
I did make some complaints in the right places and maybe somebody took it up, maybe something happened, I don't know. But that's just one example, a whole website devoted to and titled Dismantling Nehru. Uh, we know that the museum which preserved his memory and that of the struggle for freedom uh, not only has been dwarfed by building in its premises a museum to all prime ministers, the very name of that institution has now been changed. The Nehru's name has been taken away and it's now just called the Prime Minister's Museum and uh, Library. He can't even, uh, it was not even that the, the institution which had such a uh, you know, established so long ago and had such a worldwide reputation uh, was, has been wiped out of existence. And in fact, the new museum has virtually ignored Jawaharlal Nehru on the plea that there is a separate museum for him. Of course, going back to social media, uh, uh, where restraint is either missing or minimal, Flights of fancy have full sway. Nehru is depicted as a westernized, anglophile womanizer with photographs of him with his sisters and nieces being paraded as proof. He's even said to have a secret Muslim ancestry, as if that, of course, says it all. Another favorite tactic of uh, Nehru Beta's uh, oh, I forgot to tell you that there was a whole uh, uh, book which came out, which first listed 76 blunders of Jawaharlal Nehru. And now it has been updated, I think, to 127. I wonder how he keeps uh, adding in his, after long having left us, to go on adding to his blunders. But obviously this happens. Another favorite tactic of Nehru Baiters is to glorify personalities who are supposed to have been victims of neglect or denied their due by Nehru and his successors. The favorites in this list are, of course, Sardar Patel and Subhash, both, both supposed rivals of Jawaharlal Nehru. Their ideological and political differences of opinion are portrayed as personal and factional. And loaded suggestions are made that if only they had been at the helm of affairs rather than Nehru, India would have long ago become a Vishwaguru and not having wait till now. Every once in a while, insinuations that Nehru did not want Bose to return to India, that he did not make enough efforts to find out the truth about his death are made. With fake letters being circulated that Nehru supposedly wrote to the British government calling Bose a war criminal. One of my fellow historians on one TV uh, debate kept flashing that letter on the screen and threatening me with it and saying that, you know, here is what Nehru called him. It's a complete fake. In case you ever come across it, please do know that. The same arguments underpin the building of the giant statue of Sadat Patel and inserting chapters on his role in history syllabi while dropping references to Nehru. We are told, if only Sadat Patel had become the prime minister after independence, there would have been no Kashmir problem, no Article 370. Patel, it is claimed, was unfairly denied the prime ministership, which went to Nehru, despite majority of the Congress being in Patel's favor. Uh, uh, Jawaharlal, uh, just a moment. In recent times, to bolster the claim that Patel would have made a better prime minister than Nehru, and all problems, including those of Kashmir, would have been solved, it is repeatedly said that Patel was in fact the legitimate choice of the Congress itself, but was deliberately kept out. The evidence cited is that a majority of the provincial committee mem of provincial committees in 1946, sorry, the provincial Congress committees, I stand corrected, the PCCs, wanted Patel to be the president of the Congress. And if he had been elected, he would automatically have become the head of the interim government and then the prime minister once India achieved independence. Well, I'd like to point out that this line of reasoning has many flaws. 
The Congress president was elected every year or depending on the circumstances, every two years. During the war, of course, Mulana Azad stayed for a long time, except when repression made it impossible to hold a Congress session. And becoming president of the Congress for the year did not in any way make that person eligible for becoming the future prime minister of India. Even after independence, except for a short span, the party president and prime minister were two separate individuals during Nehru's lifetime. Who became the party president in 1946 was important because that person would play an important role in the negotiations with the cabinet mission and others for the transfer of power. Even if we accept the argument that the Congress president would be invited to head the interim government that would follow, even though there is no ground for this assumption, as it is the Congress, it is the Congress that would be invited to join and they would then decide whom to send. But even if we assume that, there's no reason to assume that the head of the interim government would then automatically become the prime minister of independent India. The facts are that it was Gandhiji who decided and not Nehru who maneuvered, despite the fact that the majority of the PCCs had favored Patel. His preference was for Nehru to become Congress president at this juncture. I think it's very important to emphasize because it is all the time insinuated that Nehru somehow maneuvered himself into this position. And Gandhiji did not have to make the con Nehru the Congress president in that year for him to become the prime minister because Gandhiji had already announced in January 1942 at an AICC meeting that, I quote, I have always said that not Rajaji, nor Sardar Vallabhbhai, but Jawaharlal will be my successor. He says whatever is uppermost in his mind, but he always does what I want. When I am gone, he will do what I am doing now. Then he will speak my language too. Unquote. The first time that Gandhiji indicated his inclination to choose Nehru as his heir was in 1934, as early as 1934, when he declared his formal retirement from the Congress. That's when Gandhiji gave up even primary membership of the Congress, and he never joined the Congress uh, after that. In a letter to Vallabhbhai Patel, then the president of the Congress, in which he explained his withdrawal, he said, I quote, I miss at this juncture the association and advice of Jawaharlal, who is bound to be the right helmsman of the organization in the near future. Jawaharlal Nehru was at this time in jail. Now we can speculate on what could be the reasons for this. Nehru had emerged as the mass leader second only to Gandhiji in popularity at the All India level. He was the darling of the youth and represented the rising wave of radical and socialist forces. He had a formidable knowledge of world affairs and had emerged as the All India campaigner for the Congress in the election campaign in 1936-37. I may remind you that as early as 1927, he had written a piece where he'd set out the foreign policy for India. Patel was a mass leader in Gujarat Elsewhere, he was known and respected among the Congress leaders and workers and played a major role in the Congress party organization. Gandhiji, by anointing Nehru, was not imposing his will upon the people, but recognizing the will of the people of India, which was very, very different from what some PCCs may want in one particular year. Sadar Patel obviously had a tremendous influence on the Congress party organization, and this gets reflected in the PCCs. In fact, Sadar Patel himself was great enough to tell, an Ameri to tell the American journalist Vincent Sheen when the latter remarked, marveling at the huge crowd of more than three lakhs that had come to hear Sardar Patel and Nehru in Bombay, Patel said to him, 
I quote, they come for Jawahar, not for me. Patel's greatness, in fact, lay in accepting this gracefully and working as a loyal and trusted colleague with Nehru, especially in the crucial years immediately following independence. It is well known that there were strains in their relationship, though these have been exaggerated beyond recognition. Those who want to appropriate Patel's legacy today for objectives which bear no resemblance to his ideals, like to conjure up a mythical Patel and portray him as a protector of Hindu interests who knew how to keep minorities in their place and contrast him with the mythical Nehru who sacrificed Hindu interests and bent over backwards to accommodate minority interests. The real flesh and blood Patel as Home Minister banned the RSS and sent 25,000 odd Hindu Masaba and RSS Kada, including their chief MS Golwarkal to jail after Gandhiji was assassinated and wrote to Shama Prasad Mukherjee that RSS workers distributed sweets and celebrated on hearing news of Gandhiji's assassination. He personally monitored the investigation into the assassination on a daily basis as Home Minister and came to the conclusion which he conveyed to Jawaharlal Nehru. And I quote that. It was a fanatical wing of the Hindu Mahasabha directly under Savarkar that hatched the conspiracy and saw it through, unquote. Being a fine criminal lawyer, he would never have agreed to Savarkar being arrested and put up for trial along with Gotse, Apte and others if he was not convinced of his guilt. And though Savarkar was let off on technical grounds of inadmissible evidence, Patel's views were confirmed by the findings of the Justice Jeevanlal Kapoor Committee, which was set up in 1965. And I quote, all these facts taken together were destructive of any theory other than the conspiracy to murder by Savarkar and his group. As for the mythology that Patel would have dealt successfully with the Kashmir issue and not botched it up as was done by Nehru, please consider the following facts. First, Sardar Patel was not too interested in getting Kashmir to accede to India. He was more interested in getting Hyderabad and Junagar, and it appears was even willing to let Kashmir go to Pakistan. It was Jawaharlal Nehru who was more keen that Kashmir accede to India, as apart from his Kashmiri ancestry, he had close ties with the national conference led by Sheikh Abdullah, which was the main political organization of the Kashmiri people and espoused a secular and egalitarian agenda. Of course, once Kashmir acceded to India, Patel was very much involved in defending it from the Pakistani assault. Second, we have no evidence of Sadat Patel's opposition to Article 370. And in today's context, this is very important. On the contrary, the historian Srinath Raghavan has recently argued convincingly with considerable documentary proof that Article 370 was, I quote, Sardar Patel's formulation through and through, unquote. In fact, as it happened, Nehru was out of the country and it was Sardar Patel who introduced what became Article 370 in the Constituent Assembly. The same is true of the Kashmir issue being referred to the United Nations. Even Shama Prasad Mukherjee acknowledged that as a member of Nehru's cabinet at that time, he was party to the decision to send the issue to the uh, UN. Just And the same was true of Sardar Patel. And in fact, I think we should also know that if India had not gone to the UN, Pakistan very well could have gone. So this big thing being made of Nehru, uh, you know, taking us to the UN and therefore we got stuck for years, etc. Nehru was, uh, yeah, so I go back to that. Nehru was much later, was criticized uh, for going to the UN and for offering to hold 
the plebiscite. But, oh, sorry. India has also often been misunderstood on its later refusal to hold a plebiscite because it is not widely known that the UN resolution of 19, August 1948 laid down pre two preconditions for holding a plebiscite. One, that Pakistan should withdraw its forces from the state of Jammu and Kashmir. And two, that the authority of the Srinagar administration should be restored over the whole state. These conditions were never met. And in the meantime, Kashmir went on to hold elections for its constituent assembly, which then voted for accession to India and drew up a constitution which declared Kashmir to be an integral part of India. The Indian government now took the stand that the Constituent Assembly's vote was a sufficient substitute for plebiscite. Kashmir later participated in Indian general elections as well as held its own state elections, thus rendering the debate over plebiscite uh, to, uh, irrelevant, thus rendering irrelevant the debate over plebiscite. So this was just a little detailed uh, countering because sometimes that becomes necessary of these allegations. Obviously, I cannot go into each and every one of them. I can't go into Patel. I mean, into the whole uh, debate over his relationship with uh, Subhash Bose, etc. Uh, but we all know that the Bose files about him, about uh, which much was made, they will reveal all kinds of secrets. Well, there have been a damp squib. Nobody now even talks about what could have been or what is contained in those files. I now move on to uh, the issue of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru on the on communalism and secularism. Jawaharlal Nehru's name is almost synonymous with the idea of a secular India. His faith in and commitment to the secular ideal was absolute, as absolute as his belief in freedom democracy and equity. He adhered to it during the long years of the epic struggle for independence in the wake of the colonial policy of divide and rule. He also contributed hugely to its becoming a constitutional value, not only by ensuring that it was formally embodied in the constitution, but even more by his valiant and successful struggle against communal forces in the crucial years before and after independence of which I will have more to say a little later. Secularism could be enshrined in the pages of the constitution only because the shrill demand for a Hindu Rashtra was beaten back in the streets and in the ballot boxes. It's important for us to remember that Nehru was one of the first to try and understand the socio-economic roots of communalism. And he came to believe that it was primarily a weapon of reaction, even though its social base was formed by the middle classes. He also most perceptively, but perceptively described communalism as the Indian form of fascism. He said, if fascism ever comes to India, it will be in the form of majority communalism and this is something about which we are now reminded every day. In contrast, he regarded secularism as an essential condition for democracy. There could be no democracy without secularism, he said again and again. He also did not distinguish between Hindu, Muslim, Sikh or Christian communalisms or between majority and minority communalisms. They were, he said, different forms of the same ideology and had therefore to be opposed simultaneously. While he was very clear that secularism meant giving full protection to the minorities and removing their fears, at the same time, he was as opposed to minority communalisms as to the communalism of the religious majority. He also argued most convincingly that secularism had to be the sole basis for national unity in a multi-religious society. And that, therefore, communalism was clearly a danger to national unity and was anti-national. I think it's so important for us 
to continue to remind ourselves as to who are the real anti-nationals. A good example we get of his uncompromising attitude to communal forces is the manner in which he dealt with the Bihar riots in October, November 1946. I'll go into this in a little bit of detail because it really gives you a feel of Jawaharlal Nehru as a person and as a head of the government when confronted with the problem of communalism. He was in a different kind of element. The interim government had just been formed in September 1946 with Jawaharlal Nehru at its head, and the Congress could wield at least partial state power at the center. In Bihar, anger had been brewing ever since news had come of large number of Biharis being killed in Calcutta during the direct action day violence in August 1946, which, as you know, happened because Jinnah gave a call for direct action. The news from Noakhali of organized attacks on Hindus added to this, and violence broke out in Bihar on 25th October 1946, which was observed as Noakhali Day. Large bands of Hindu peasants roamed the rural areas of Patna, Gaya, and Monger districts, and entire villages of Muslims were reported to have been wiped out. This was the first time that communalism spread in such a big way into the rural areas. Up till then, it had essentially in India been an urban phenomenon. The contrast with Noakhali, which had a Muslim League government, was evident from the start. The response of the Provincial Congress government was firm and effective, and it went all out to suppress the trouble, and the situation was brought under control in less than two weeks. Nehru, how did this happen? Nehru, as head of the interim government at the national level, he not only backed the provincial government, but he rushed to Bihar from Calcutta, where he had gone in connection with the riots in Noakhali. He didn't wait for four months, five months to wait for things to, you know, really blow themselves up in his face and declared his intention to stay as long as it took to bring about peace. Between the 4th and 9th of November, Jawaharlal Nehru, Sardar Patel, Rajinder Prasad, Molana Azad, Acharya Kriplani, Jay Prakash Narayan, and many other Congress leaders covered the whole affected areas, holding public meetings and rallies, meeting officials as well as ordinary people, promising and ensuring prompt redress to victims, warning and persuading the pre perpetrators to give up their madness and return to sanity. In fact, it is in Bihar that we get the first glimpse of the unambiguous, determined, and even emotional quality of Nehru's secularism. He went from place to place addressing the people. His determination and desperation were simultaneously in evidence. One by one, he brandished all the weapons in his armory, the coercive power of the state, the prestige and ideals of the freedom struggle, the prestige of Gandhiji, his own personal prestige and much else. He declared, I quote, I will stand in the way of Hindu-Muslim riots. Members of both the communities will have to tread over my dead body before they can strike at each other. With the coming of independence in August 1947, his resolve became even firmer. In a broadcast on All India Radio, four days after independence, he said, our state is not a communal state, but a democratic state in which every citizen has equal rights. The government is determined to protect these rights. Nostalgia, one wishes one had those kinds of prime ministers anymore. However, on the 4th of September, violence broke out in Delhi itself, right under the nose of the central government and of Nehru and continued till the 11th, a whole week, during which time some 2,000 people were reportedly killed. A military force of 5,000 was brought in to patrol the streets of Delhi. The cabinet secretary, H.M. H. M. Patel, describes in his memoirs at great length the conditions in Delhi at that time. In Old Delhi, for example, he tells us, life was all but paralyzed. I quote, 
For days together, shops remained unopened, offices ceased to function, health services were disrupted and communications were disorganized. Muslims fled to refugee camps for security. The Emergency Committee of the Cabinet formed the Delhi Emergency Committee with Cabinet Minister Bhaba as Chairman, H.M. Patel as Secretary, and a central control room was set up to organize the law and order and relief efforts. And in two weeks, the situation in the city was brought under control. One and a half lakh Muslims were in camps, and the sense of insecurity among the Muslims took longer to disappear. But, and I'm quoting, though it would be correct to say that by the first week of October, within a month, a Muslim could move about the city without any real danger to his life or limb. A public speech by Nehru on 29th September 47 shows how he put all that he had into the battle for what he called secular democracy. I quote, the demand for making India a Hindu state is a virtual victory for the Muslim League, a victory compared with which the achievement of Pakistan is of very little significance. All talk of Hindu Raj is an aspect of narrow-mindedness. Hinduism is strong enough to stand by itself without artificial ideological crutches. We are now told all the time that Hinduism is in danger. It took all the power of the state as well as appeals to emotion, reason, history, nationalism to somewhat contain the tide of communal violence, at least temporarily. However, as we know, it was Gandhiji's assassination on 30th January 1948, which brought the Hindu communal onslaught to a halt. A shocked and guilt-ridden people stopped in their tracks and tried to heed the message of the Mahatma, which they had tended to forget when he was alive. And as for Nehru, after Gandhiji's martyrdom, he converted the first general election campaign into a movement against communalism. He traveled nearly 40,000 kilometers, addressing an estimated 35 million people or one-tenth of India's population directly. And the main issue which he took up was that of communalism. The result was that the communal parties put together, the Hindu Mahasabha, the newly formed Jan Sangh, and the Ram Raja Parishad, between them won only 10 Lak Lok Sabha seats in a house of 489 and polled less than 6% of the vote. This was just to give you a flavor uh, of how deeply and seriously Nehru took the issue of secularism and communalism. I will now come to the issue of democracy and civil liberties and discuss briefly uh, how what was Nehru's position and a practice uh, on these issues. Carrying on the traditions of the national movement, Nehru carefully nurtured and entrenched democracy and parliamentary government in independent India. He fought three general elections on the basis of universal adult franchise and secret ballot and made elections the norm and not an exception. His commitment to democracy and civil liberties was total. To him, they represented absolute values and not means to an end. He would not subordinate them to any other goals, whether of social change or socioeconomic development. He was aware that the parliamentary system had its weaknesses and he made efforts to remove them. But as I, as he said, I quote, I would, he said, I will not give up the democratic system for anything, unquote. Even his immense personal power and popularity could not corrupt the Democrat in Nehru. On the contrary, he used his strength to reinforce the democratic process. Though he dominated the politics after 1950, within the Congress party too, he promoted internal democracy and open debate and tried to create an institutional structure which was democratic and went in which power was diffused. A constitution with civil liberties enshrined, a sovereign parliament elected on the basis of universal suffrage and regular elections, a free press, 
a cabinet government and an independent judiciary. He was, of course, very well aware of the authoritarian tendencies in the country and even in his own party. I quote him, our democracy, he said in 51, is a tender plant which has to be nourished with wisdom and care. And so he tried his best to instill in the common people of India, because he felt that is where the strength of democracy always would lie, a real taste for democracy. He tried to inculcate what I call the habits of democracy. He regularly toured the land, sharing his ideas with the people, trying to educate them in the ways of rational and democratic thinking. And when asked what would he, what would he want to be his legacy to India, he said, hopefully it is 400 million people capable of governing themselves. Particularly to ensure the unity of a diverse society like India, Nehru argued, democracy was essential. No amount of force or coercion could hold India together. In 1960, for example, he said, in India today, any reversal of democratic methods might lead to disruption and violence. Just before his death in 1964, as quoted by Karanjia, he said, I quote, this is too large a country with too many legitimate diversities to permit any so-called strong man to trample over people and their ideas. Nehru was aware of the formidable, novel and unprecedented character of his effort to develop the country economically on the basis of a democratic and civil libertarian political structure. No other country had attempted this so far. Most other nations and societies had used authoritarian and administrative measures and institutions during the period of their economic takeoff. He was aware that his path of development might slow down the rate of economic development. But Indian people, he felt, were willing to pay this price for the sake of a democratic political order. Civil liberties were put on a firm footing with the press having free play, even when it criticized the government severely. Independence of the courts was carefully nurtured, even when they turned down imp an important piece of popular legislation, namely agrarian reform. Further, he treated parliament with great respect, even though his party enjoyed an overwhelming majority in it. He spent hours sitting in parliament, attending parliamentary debates and answering questions that were raised. And in the one and only time when a motion of no confidence was brought against him in parliament, he sat for four long days listening to all the speeches, including very vitriolic ones by Ram Manohar Lohia and uh, company and then replied to each and every point that had been raised by the opposition. He also encouraged parliamentary committees to play an important role as critics and watchdogs of the government administration. Further, under his leadership, the cabinet system of government evolved in a healthy manner and functioned effectively. I will just give you one quote from Siri Deshmukh to make the point. He was India's finance minister from 1950 to 56. And in his autobiography, he writes, and as you know, he was a former ICS. I quote, Nehru as head of the cabinet was gentle, considerate and democratic, never forcing a decision on his colleagues. Decisions were taken by a consensus and never, as far as I can remember, in my time by vote. Despite the dominance of the Congress party, the role of the opposition was strengthened during this period. He gave full play and respect to the opposition parties and, as I said, was very responsible, responsive to their criticism. I conclude this section by quoting 
uh, how he defined democracy, which I think is very, very interesting. It goes far beyond any formal description or definition of democracy. I quote, in the ultimate analysis, democracy is a manner of thinking, a manner of action, a manner of behavior to your neighbor and to your adversary and opponent. One grows, one only wonders wistfully where all these beautiful ideals and ideas have gone. I will now briefly uh, take up uh, an issue which I think is extremely important and it's not something that has been a matter of uh, debate either in the public uh, domain or even very much in the ac academic domain, but I think it's extremely important uh, for us faced with the task of bringing about social and political change in the world of today to go back and look at some of these issues. So I basically want to take up Nehru's evolving understanding of Gandhiji and his method, and particularly the issue of nonviolence. Nehru's understanding of Gandhiji and his methods based on nonviolence changed considerably over time. While earlier, that is before 1936-37, he accepted nonviolence as a policy he increasingly began to accept it as a principle. Uh, as early as uh, uh, his presidential address in 1929, we have a very clear statement where Nehru says that he believes that nonviolence is an essential principle for mass movements. It is a necessary part of mass movement. So as a policy, he was very much convinced that the Gandhian method was the right method for India at that time. But still at a philosophical level and at a broader level and deeply influenced as he was by socialism and Marxism, he did believe that there may be a time, there could be occasions when violent methods were necessary were desirable, were important. But we find that from 19, and he argued with Gandhiji extensively on this in public, in writing. While earlier, sorry, after 1936-37, we begin to see a distinct change in his approach. This could be for various reasons, his increasing uh, experience within India itself. After all, let's not forget, in 1936-37, he was the main campaigner for the Congress in the provincial elections, where he traveled extensively all over India. And, uh, uh, you know, so the whole experience of dealing with people at that level, uh, of familiarizing himself with them, understanding their psychology, meeting people all over the country, meeting meeting uh, nationalist fighters, freedom fighters all over the country. All of this may have had a powerful impact on him in terms of what this method meant. But I think it's important to also recognize that this was the same time that news started coming in of the Stalinist trials and killings in the Soviet Union. This is the period 1937 to 39, which is known as the period of the Stalinist purges. And I think this considerably shook Nehru's uh, belief in the socialist Marxist model as a total model. While he continued to adhere to socialism as a desirable goal, to Marxism as a method of analysis, particularly to understand history, he, he, he began to change in terms of accepting the Marxist and so, uh, socialist view of that time that class struggle <laughs> using methods of violence was the necessary path to revolution. And he became more and more convinced that the Gandhian method had a lot of potential in this. And though I have very little time, I'll try to share how, how he expresses this in his own uh, uh, understanding. There are many places where we find examples of this, but I was very struck uh, some few months ago, I came across 
a speech which uh, Jawaharlal Nehru gave on his first visit to the United States in 1949. And I found uh, that in speech after speech on that visit, he was talking repeatedly about Mahatma Gandhi and his ideals. And in a particular speech which he gave at the Chicago University, he explained at length the working of the Gandhian method. And I will just like to quote to you from that rather than try to interpret him because he obviously can do much better than I possibly could uh, to uh, explain what he really understood. He starts talking about the freedom struggle and I'm quoted him, quoting him. He says, you know that during the last 30 years or so, we carried on rather intensively our campaign for India's freedom. We did not begin it. It was there. But it came more to the world's notice then because a world figure stepped into the arena of Indian politics. That is Mahatma Gandhi. And he produced a very remarkable change in India. I was, of course, much younger then, but still I have the most vivid memories of that change because it affected me as it affected millions of our people. We were at that time a very frustrated people, hankering and yearning for freedom and not knowing what to do about it. Further, this was a power which was not superficially there, merely by force of arms, but which had dug down deep into the roots of India. The British the colonial power is what he's talking about. It seemed an extraordinarily difficult task to remove it. So he's basically talking about the hegemony of British rule. At that time, Gandhi came on the scene and he offered a way of political action to us. It was an odd way, a new way. What he said was not new in its essence. Great men had said it previously, but there was a difference in that he applied that teaching to mass political action. Something which the individual had been taught to do in his individual life was suddenly sought to be adopted for mass action. And mass action in a vast country of people who from the educational point of view were illiterate, untrained, and a thoroughly frightened, and thoroughly frightened people who were obsessed with fear. And he talks then about 80% of our population, which is the peasantry who were kicked around by everybody, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Well, Gandhi came and he told them there was a way out. First of all, shed your fear. Do not be afraid. And then act in a united way, but always peacefully. How beautifully Nehru summarizes Gandhi's message here. Do not bear any ill will in your hearts against your opponent. You are fighting a system, not an individual, not a race, not the people of another country. You are fighting the imperialist system or the colonial system. Now, it was not very easy for us to understand all of this. But most more difficult it must have been for our peasantry, for instance. But the fact remains that there was some power in his voice, something in him which seemed to infuse other people with courage and make them feel that this man was not an empty talker. Almost magically, his influence spread. He was all well known before that, but not in this particular way. Within a few months, we saw a change come over our countryside. The peasantry began to behave differently. It straightened its back. It looked you in the face. Now, this did not happen automatically, of course, for Gandhi's message was carried to these peasants in the countryside by tens of thousands of young men and young women. First of all, they went to the people who became enthusiastic about it and accepted it. Within a few months, the whole situation changed in India. Thus started in India what might be called the Gandhian era in our politics, which lasted under it till his death and which in some form or other will always continue. And then Nehru goes on to explain what this movement really did. And here's the theoretical part of his explanation. He says, you may have heard that a large number of us, a hundred thousand of us were in prison and apparently nothing was happening in India. 
the movement for freedom was suppressed. It was so in a superficial sense. Six months later or a year later, suddenly one would find that the movement was very much alive. Repeatedly, the British government was amazed. It would think that it had put an end to this business and then it would find that it had started off at a higher pitch than ever. He continues, how do governments function? A democratic government in the ultimate analysis functions largely with the goodwill of the people and with their cooperation. Even an autocratic government has to have a measure of goodwill. In the ultimate analysis, a government functions because of certain sanctions which it has and which are represented by its army or police force. If the government is in line with the thought of a majority of the people, it is a democratic government and only a very small majority of minority of the people will feel its pressure. Now, if an individual refuses to be afraid of these sanctions, what can the government do? It may put him in prison. He's not afraid. He welcomes it. He may be shot down. He's not afraid of facing death. Well, then a government has to face a crisis. That is, a government, in spite of its great power, cannot really conquer an individual. It may kill him, but it cannot kill his spirit. That is failure on the part of the government. A government which is essentially based upon sanctions, apart from other factors, comes up against something, the spirit of man which refuses to be afraid of these sanctions. Now, this is a thing which normally governments don't understand. They are upset by it. They don't know how to deal with it. They can, of course, deal with the individual in the normal way of treating him as a criminal. But that too does not work because that man does not feel like a criminal, nor do others regard him as a criminal. So it does not work. So that this process, he then says, this technique of action was not one of overwhelming a government so much by mass action, although there was that phase of it, but rather one of undermining the prestige of a government before which an individual would not bow. Many of you, no doubt, have read something very like this in Thoreau's writings. But this was developed on a mass scale by Gandhi. Naturally, the people of India were weak. They were frail human beings. They slipped and made mistakes. But nevertheless, on the whole, they functioned according to that technique and ultimately they triumphed. And that is what I would like you to bear in mind. I think I've taken long enough and maybe I should just stop here by concluding uh, that, you know, there are obviously so many facets to this man, a truly a renaissance man, a many splendored personality, a great writer, a wonderful historian, uh, a great freedom fighter who spent more than nine years in prison. The more I try to delve into his writings and into his work, the more I stand in awe of him, just as I do of Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, I, had, I, I only wanted to make a small attempt to share some of this uh, with you in the hope that it will give us strength, it will give us courage, and it will inspire us to continue uh, the struggle uh, which we are in and uh, which becomes our responsibility precisely because those that went before us, led by people like Jawaharlal Nehru, Mahatma Gandhi, Sadar Patel, gave so much to bring us where we are. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Mukherjee, uh, for, for a very thought-provoking presentation. And in, in times when the project to blame, blame it on Nehru is going on in an organized way, so all the facets of uh, many of the facets, important facets of uh, Nehru's persona and his ideology and his the way he operated, he came, uh, you, you explained. There are many dignitaries in this audience, uh, but before I invite them, I will request my friend and comrade uh, Ravi to say, say a few words. Ravi. Subhash, and thank you, Mridala ji. Such a, as expected, you know, as always, you know, from you, uh, such a fabulous talk. 
so scholarly, so erudite, uh, and at the in a in a mild way, so forceful. You know, we are. Uh, thank you once again for accepting uh, to come for the second time on our platform. You know, we had you uh, last year or year before sometime. Uh, it's it's our good fortune. Uh, my job is to when while Subhash and Bhargo um, uh, begin prepare their list to uh, invite questions and comments from the audience. My job is to start. My job is to start the discussion. Um, I couldn't. I couldn't agree more with you in whatever you have said, you know, so I wouldn't uh, uh, make a comment uh, on, on, on what has gone on. But just to start the discussion, uh, let me bring uh, a point that you raised at the end um, between the philosophical and ideological political um, uh, relationship between Nehru and Gandhi, you know, uh, and what is the relationship between being a Nehruvian and being a Gandhian? Um, you said that you know in this uh, Amrit Kal there were there are posters of uh, um, the freedom fighters and Nehru is missing for that from that post that poster. You know, strangely, I have seen. Um, posters containing dozens of freedom fighters that some Gandhian leaders of today, you know, of Gandhi, who call themselves Gandhian, Lohiaite, followers of Jayaprakash Narayan, and you know, I mean, many of the regional parties and forces, some leaders belonging to them, sitting on TV with, uh, with portraits of freedom fighters, and from their list also, um, Nehru is missing, you know. So the relationship um, that the I think not only the Sangh Parivar and their kind is afraid of Jawaharlal Nehru. There are others and many Gandhians too who appear to be in some ways afraid of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. So my question will be that uh, um, okay, if it is uh, if it is possible to be Gandhian without being Nehruvian, you know, what would you say to those people? And the second part of the question will be that, is it possible to be Nehruvian without being Gandhian? You know, I mean, without knowing much, I sometimes feel that um, even though I am a Marxist, but I, all, I am also a Nehruvian. And I always struggle with, the, with this thing that much as I admire Gandhi for his secularism, for his bringing Indian people into the national movement and into the anti-colonial project, you know, if you look at his vision of future, his worldview about how society should be organized and how a people should live, um, I am I fail to reconcile that with the worldview of Nehru, with which I find myself in agreement. So I find that I am a Nehruvian without being Gandhi Gandhian, even though I admire. Gandhi greatly. And I am sure that Gandhi was a great leader, maybe greater than Nehru. So what would you say to those who are Gandhian without being Nehruvian? And to me, who feels like I have more overlap with Nehru than with Gandhi? Please, please. please. Uh, oh, you want me to reply now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay, I thought you were taking questions. No, no, please, please. Okay, well, I think that's a very interesting uh, uh, formulation that you have made and the question, the way in which you have put it. Firstly, about Gandhians, uh, you know, your earlier part of your question about, uh, I'm not surprised what you say that when you see many of them with uh, portraits of posters of uh, lists of freedom fighters when Nehru is not there. We all know that uh, many of the so-called Gandhians became very anti-Nehru. And we also know that many of these so-called Gandhians have become very pro-Hindutva uh, as well, you know. So I think, uh, and if I if I may say so, uh, uh, the, perhaps some of the greatest disservice 
that has been done to Mahatma Gandhi is by those who proclaimed themselves as Gandhians, you know. And uh, the they they essentially, I think, lost the essence of Gandhi, you know, which I think Nehru got. The essence of Gandhiji was struggle, resistance. And in this little passage that I quoted to you from many hundreds of others that I could have used, uh, where he explains, you know, what Gandhi was about, what does he pick up? You know, what does he focus on? You know, what, how he taught people not to be, how he taught people basically to resist. You know, and that was his greatest uh, contribution. Now, uh, if you see that that legacy has, by which, which of these Gandhians uh, outfits carry on that legacy at all? It's not there, you know, completely gone. So I think... Uh, Leaving that aside, and as far as your question is concerned, I think, firstly, in my understanding, one doesn't have to be any Ian, you know, Gandhian or Nehruvian or Marxian or, you know, uh, Lohian, Lohiite or whatever. I think that as a historian, uh, the way I look back, uh, I, you know, I, I admire Sadar Patel as well for many things. You know, as uh, somebody uh, who played a, a fantastic role in the struggle for freedom, but I'm not a Patelian, you know. Uh, so uh, I think what we, what the only approach that I think for myself that works is that we look objectively and study whatever we can to the extent possible more and more to try and understand what these people. Uh, how they thought, how they functioned, and how we can learn something from them for our own times, which can be of use to us. As a historian and as a citizen, I have a dual role. You know, one that I bring my skills as a historian to, to go on mining that huge uh, reservoir, you know, of knowledge, information, you know, uh, understanding, wisdom, and try and then bring it, distill what one can from it for the present. And then one can take from every from everywhere. You know? And uh, there, in my own case, I would say that, uh, you know, I think I find, I have increasingly found some of the best insights into Gandhiji as a person, as a leader, as a practitioner, you know, of uh, of a leader of the Congress in Nehru's writings. There are so many things about this passage, which I read out to you, is the first person I have seen and I've read a lot of people who've tried to analyze the Gandhian method, you know, where he, which, where he points out that this, it's a combination of individual decisions and the role of the individual also, who is convinced, who gives up his fear and who's convinced that he has to take this action, which all then add up to this mass action. It's not just a mass action, but it is hundreds and thousands of deeply committed uh, individuals who have shed their fear, who together then make this mass. And how this, you know, so this whole combination, this play between individual Volition and the mass is is a deep insight uh, into how it how this works, you know. And there are so many more like this. I mean, they are sort of strewn all over because after independence, unfortunately, <laughs> Nehru never went to jail, so we didn't get another book out of him. <laughs> you know, I often say how I wish, you know, somehow he got some more leisure sometime in the late 50s and we could have got one more out of him, you know, <laughs> because uh, autobiography, glimpses, discovery, in all of them, you can go on discovering uh, his changing understanding, you know. Uh, so uh, I think uh, I I see Nehru as a guide to Gandhi for myself. Uh, uh, before I take up questions uh, in the chat box, I would like to invite 
Manishankar Ayyar sahab to, to share his views and comments. Manishankar ji, please. Well, this is most unexpected. Uh, I have heard Mridula often enough, but I don't think I've ever heard her at her brilliant best as she was today. And all I would like to really request as a follow-up to this meeting is that the longer thesis that she was apparently reading from every now and then, besides her impromptu comments, that should be circulated very widely. I would certainly like to receive a copy myself. And I think her discovering that Chicago speech of Jawaharlal Nehru is really an example of mining and succeeding in finding the nugget of gold. For, as she said, there is no better example of his understanding of the process of uh, nonviolent resistance, nonviolent non-cooperation than that passage from his speech in Chicago. So we all know that Swami Vivekananda wo woke up the world to Hindu philosophy by his exposition in Chicago in the late 19th century on what Hinduism really meant. I don't think Mr. Modi has ever read that speech. And if he has, I don't think he's understood a word of it. And I think this applies right across the board to the entire Sangh Parivar and their philosophy of Hindutva. What, uh, what Nehru has done was in the same city to expound the essence of Mahatma Gandhi's thinking. Now, what is even more interesting is that through the formative years between, let us say, 1916 uh, and 1942, when he was anointed, or perhaps even 1934, when he was anointed as Gandhi's successor, he was not in agreement with Gandhi. Right. That Gandhi was great enough to realize that this man has absorbed the essence of what I'm saying. And so it does not matter if we differ on the detail. And he went so far as to say, I think Mridula quoted it, but I'm not 100% sure, that after I have gone, yes. you will discover yeah. that my voice remains on Jawaharlal's tongue. Yeah. And uh, it is, I think, I, I was asked even yesterday by none other than the wife of our former Vice President, Hamid Ansari, at a very personal dinner in my home, she asked, why did Gandhi not go on fast to prevent the formation of Pakistan? After all, he almost killed himself on the question of what he later was to call the Harijans being part of the Hindu fold. On other occasions too, he had gone to the doorstep of death rather than relent on any given point. But when it came to partition, and using the same language as Jawaharlal Nehru did, I didn't know until today that Jawaharlal had said that over his dead body, well, that was the same expression used by Gandhi, that partition would take place only over his dead body. Yet when the time came, he deferred to Nehru, we had come to the conclusion that partition is the price we have to pay for independence. Right. That if we refuse partition now, we will be denied independence now. And this historic moment, this historic conjunction at which the British want to leave India and we want them to leave India may not occur again. <laughs> 
and therefore he accepted partition as the price to pay for independence. But Mahatma Gandhi never explained his logic in not going the last mile to prevent the partition of India. So let me end my unexpected and uncalled for intervention by posing a question to the historian in Ridala as to why is it that, or, just like posing exactly the same question as was posed to me yesterday. And I gave my answer, but I am not very satisfied with what I said. So I'm posing it now again to Mridullah. Why did Mahatma Gandhi not go on a fast and to death to prevent the partition of India? All right. Well, uh, there is an answer which uh, Mahatma Gandhi himself gave uh, a little earlier when not exactly to this question whether or why don't you go on a fast to prevent the partition of India, but uh, he was asked in 1946, why don't you start a movement now against the ongoing communal thing and obviously against this demand for partition of India? And there is a reply which he gave, I wish I had known, I would have had the exact quotation for you, but I can paraphrase it. And then I can discuss the issue. He said, you know, you people have a very wrong idea that I can create a movement whenever I want. He said, "My, I cannot create a movement out of nothing. There has to be something positive stirring in the hearts of the people for me to then seize it and build upon it and give it a shape. That's what I do, he said. That's my talent, that when there is something positive, I can sense it, I can feel it, and then I can build on it. At the moment, he said, exactly in these terms, I see no such positive feeling. There is everybody, basically, he says, has been communalized. The, the communal sentiment has spread. It, later on, he says, in, in 47, I remember, he says, the Khalsa wants it, the Hindu wants it, the Muslim wants it. They all want partition. And uh, to come to uh, more directly to your question in the, for the last phase from March onwards when Mountbatten comes and, you know, the partition plan becomes uh, this thing and daily discussions are going on on this. Uh, and this is the period in which then finally uh, when Patel and Nehru and all, they come to the conclusion that there is no alternative uh, to partition and uh, with uh, it is something that we have to swallow. And then there is this meeting of the AICC in uh, June, which is attended by Gandhi. That's again his greatness. You know, it's not that he would just stay away from that meeting and pretend as if, you know, he's against partition, but these leaders are betraying him. This Again, there's a very wrong presentation of Gandhi being neglected and ignored and, you know, Patel and Nehru hungry for power, ignoring Gandhi, who wanted the unity of India, but they wanted power and therefore they went for partition. This is a whole lot of nonsense. I, I may also say that for a very detailed uh, 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 you know, exploration of this, there is Sucheta Mahajan's book on independence and partition, which goes into this with great length, citing, citing chapter and verse from, from Gandhi, from British records, from everywhere, which you might like to look at sometime. But uh, it's very clear that he understands and sees their position. And he sits in the Congress Working Committee, uh, AICC meeting where this resolution is passed, where the Congress accepts the partition. So it's not as if he was standing away from it. Obviously, he doesn't want it. Nobody wants. The point, of course, also is to understand that nobody wanted partition. Why would Nehru and Patel and Kriplani and, you know, Molana Azad or anybody, you know, who had fought all their life for a united India. They had sat for three years, three years in British prison from 42 to 45. They just come out of that. And now would they want to partition this land? 
you know it's this is so the whole debate is the, the the way of posing the question is skewed your question is fine why did he because you imagine that mahatma gandhi could use the fast or any other we weapon as he chose and it would work you know at the the point is not that he would have been willing to sacrifice his life if he could have if could have achieved anything and certainly for the unity of india he was willing to sacrifice his life to bring about communal harmony in january of 1948 just a week 10 uh, days before he actually was assassinated you know where he was in very bad health they were really worried about him at that time so repeatedly in in calcutta he goes on a fast to bring about harmony in uh, at the end of august just before he comes to delhi you know so it's not that so where he can he thinks it can work which is to bring about amity he's trying to do that noakhali i mean after all let's not also forget that he had spent four months in noakhali battling communalism at the level of the village in a muslim dominated area where hindus were under stress where there was a hostile government you know in place he had spent 4 months so he knew what was going on at the ground level so obviously while he fought and fought and fought against it he also somewhere knew what had happened to the people of india at that time and how deep it had gone into people's consciousness you know so i think it's a complex uh, uh, situation to which there are no easy answers but certainly the answer cannot be found in gandhi ji's unwillingness to do whatever he thought he could possibly ever have including give up his life he was willing to give up his life for much less well thank you very and, much you know, and and let me just say also that you must also understand that this and this is something nehru and others were very conscious of that a forcible imposition or rejection of partition also could have meant a massacre by the majority community you see the one thing they nehru and everybody said again and again we don't we cannot force unity on any any section of our people so if the muslims want partition and if that's very clear that they want it you know we cannot keep them with us by force that was also because that was a principle of the congress you know every people have the right to choose their including for the princely states that was the principle nobody was to be forced into joining india whether a community or a state and this it had reached a point where it was felt that this is what it was <laughs> i don't thank you very much for that extraordinarily clear explanation and that too on the spur of the moment because you had not anticipated this question from me and i had not planned to ask it <laughs> it is sheer coincidence that the question came up yesterday i was dissatisfied with my own answer but i think i can now answer salma <laughs> ansari far more convincingly than i was able to do yesterday and i shall certainly read Sucheta Mahajan's book, of which I had no knowledge until I heard it from you just now. <laughs> Unfortunately for me, tragically, I would say, I read economics at university. I am not a not even a history student, let alone being a historian. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was very generous. <laughs> ഹലോസ് uh statement made by the dollars q uh it's a question but it it's written in the form of a disappointment and dismay over, uh, over the 
historical terms. Many thanks for wonderful presentation. With the benefit of insight, today many efforts wherever we live are left pondering the paradox of how representative democracy devolves into majority and tyranny. We felt that institutions will withstand. Today we see the evacuation of these institutions. Sorry, I didn't follow the last part. Uh, let me look at the chat box if I can maybe. We, we felt that institutions will withstand, but today we see the evisceration of these institutions is the last part. Okay. So this is a comment really, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. And I, I, you, if you want to respond to it, maybe in connection, uh, connecting it with some other question, maybe you can do it. I, I Let me read another question by, um, uh, by a series of questions, but actually they all form into one question. Uh, Niranjan Pan, uh, he, the question is, <clears throat> now denying that Jawaharlal Nehru was the best thing to happen in newly independent India, but to prevent this talk from becoming a panjadi, as limiting characteristics should also have been mentioned, no one is perfect. And uh, many uh, um, foundation of all evil that we see today including rehabilitation of Savarkar, was laid by Indira Gandhi, why Nehru promoted her, uh, and especially the basement of institution at Sarkla were also contributed by Indira Gandhi. And she, he, went, he, he goes on to uh, ask that, um, yes, this is, this is it, Nehru, why there is no second generation leadership and why he promoted Indira Gandhi. And Indira Gandhi played a big role in bringing in authoritarian elements into Indian politics. Welcome, Professor. I can I can ask Professor Dolores to to do it to put her query more clearly. She had made some comment. She can herself say what what she wants to say more. Professor Professor Dolores would like to add. Uh, yes, I'm I'm, I'm trying to open my camera and I think my sound might not be the best and I have a cough. Well, what I had said first. But you are audible, please. Just to mm -hmm. thank please. you, love, for an amazing for an amazing presentation but like many of us in different parts of the world today are sitting and you know that sense that somehow whether we favored it or not liberal representative democracy is being usurped and becoming majoritarian tyranny and we had thought at least there are institutions they will withstand no matter who's there but we are seeing our institutions themselves becoming eviscerated so it's more like a a, a kind of a, a a sigh and and a sadness i don't have an answer it's not a question and of course you know when nehru and all were sort of setting things up they all had dreams right we, we are living now several decades down the road and we're like what what happened so it's more like a sigh and very quickly i also wanted to say that in 1995 in, in Montreal, we had the uh, World Historical Congress. And I remember being on a panel here with Panikar, and this was just the start of all this. It's like the Towards Freedom volumes, you know, were being changed. And somebody got up from the audience and said, what about the Piltdown horse from Indus Valley? Fortunately for us, Michael Witzer, a scholar, was sent Sanskrit scholar who studied this was sitting next to him. But those such distant days, you know, we could sort of dismiss those. You know, now they are there, they are at the helm. And I was just listening to all the things Mridula was pointing out. And it's so hard to keep track on a daily basis everything they're doing. So sorry, it's not a question. It's just like a, a, a long sigh. Thank, thank you. We have with us Professor uh, Zoya Asan also. I will, I will request her to unmute and share her comment. Professor Zoya Asan. Zoya Ji. Ji. Please, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are audible. Well, thank you very much. I really don't have a question, but since you've asked me, I just want to compliment Mridula. 
on a very uh, brilliant and uh, brilliant lecture. And I found the last part of the lecture, especially uh, the part about the relationship between Nehru and Gandhi, really fascinating. And I thought what was really interesting was the point she was making that before independence, uh, Nehru understood the essence of Gandhi as resistance. And he emphasized the aspect of resistance. But even after independence, when uh, Nehru is at the helm and is the prime minister, he still he embraced Gandhi with even greater uh, force. And I think she contextualized it. And that, I thought, was important. I mean, the point she was making that it was partly that even though Nehru uh, was uh, uh, attracted to socialism and Marxism, but he was increasingly disillusioned with what was happening. And I thought she was suggesting that perhaps that might have been one of the reasons why Nehru embraced uh, embraced Gandhi and Gandhian methods uh, as forcefully as he did. And I think that passage that she read out uh, from his uh, Chicago speech, where, and she ended with that passage, which is really very interesting. I must confess that I also wasn't aware of that particular speech. And all I would say, uh, urge, is that I hope uh, Bridala will develop uh, this part, the relationship between Nehru and Gandhi and Nehru's understanding of Gandhi after independence and after, uh, really, if you like, the end of Gandhi's life. I thought that was really interesting. And she was quite right in pointing out that this is something that is not adequately discussed or uh, talked about. And I found that really, uh, uh, really very interesting. And I just hope that she will, uh, you know, we will have the benefit of another uh, talk by her on this subject. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Zaha. <laughs> <clears throat> uh, yeah. uh, Harati Pagishan has raised his hand. Actually, I will request him to. Oh, Harati. Yeah. Can Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. You're audible. See this the dichotomy which we bring between uh, Gandhi and Nehru. Is it, uh, Mridula ji, is it, can we bring such kind of a dichotomy? Because uh, if we can, uh, because we didn't resurrect radical Gandhi also. And Nehru definitely uh, knowing uh, Gandhi better than uh, our generation. I'm Vagish. I teach political science at Nalsar University of Law, Hyderabad. I'm in the first part of my 50s. So, uh, is it fine to uh, bring fine is a wrong word wrong uh, wrong word but then is it okay to say that uh, Gandhi was uh, not a modernist so the later avatars many people who today embrace Gandhi are uh, making use of him and then Nehru is a modernist so this uh, anti-modernist modernist dichotomy is it is it fair to bring that in and then say that uh, gandhi was looking backwards and nehru was looking forward okay yeah say some, something Professor Mukherjee? yeah okay. like, no, please 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 okay so i'll just uh, comment on some of the questions which have been raised so far, some of the um, there was somebody, and I don't remember names very well, I'm sorry, uh, so please excuse me. Uh, why did Nehru promote Indira Gandhi and then it was, and then Indira Gandhi was this and that and the other, you know, I think that question. Uh, it, it assumes many things, you know. It makes a categorical statement that Nehru promoted Indira Gandhi. And then it makes very many categorical statements about what Indira Gandhi uh, was responsible for. And somehow Nehru is responsible for what Indira Gandhi did. You know, I, I wish uh, as parents we were always so confident that uh, 
you know, <laughs> that our children will do exactly what we want them to do. I think nobody who's been a parent will ever <laughs> vouch for that. <laughs> they tend to do the opposite, actually. But on a more serious note, uh, I personally do not believe that Jawaharlal <laughs> Nehru promoted uh, Indira Gandhi. Indira Gandhi did become once the president of the Congress in one particular year uh, during his uh, lifetime. But she did. Labashani had a bit of a battle and a struggle against Shamsi in the semi final. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> please, please. In fact, uh, if anything, we, we, we know he was promoting Sha Lal Bahadur Shastri. Well, to stop it, uh, initially, had no confidence whatsoever. So I don't know what's happening. So Subhash, you can Subhash, you can mute everybody while right. when right. Rudraji is speaking. Yeah. Yet in the mute everybody else. Yes, I did. Yes. Please. Okay. Uh right. So and I think in any case it's going away from the main uh discussion in the in the talk, you know. And I think the person also said so that it doesn't become a kind of panegyric to Nehru. Well, that is not my intention. I took up certain aspects of uh, Nehru. Obviously, I can't do everything. And uh, yes, there, I can also make a critique of many aspects of Nehru, but that's not what we were doing today. We were just looking at some few very, we were looking at the kind of vicious campaign against him that's happening. Uh, and the kind of things that emerge in that. And then we were looking at certain very specific aspects of uh, uh, his uh, contribution. Uh, Nehru, why did he... Okay. Well, Dolores uh, too said, well, she as she said, this is more a sigh and uh, why the institutions have crumbled. Well, that I think is a big question mark. Which, uh, which big question for us to look at seriously, why is it that the institutions have not stood up better? I don't have an answer, but I, I completely agree that that is one of the things where we ne really need to look at. Because also because if, if we do have an opportunity to reverse these, then I think we need to know where we went wrong. You know, it's very, very important to look back. Obviously, there were weaknesses in the way uh, institutions worked, in the kind of relationship between institutions and the government. For example, the whole <clears throat> the whole textbook controversy, for example, did make us think. And this is not the first time it has happened, the NCRT. Uh, because in the first NDA government, they, immediately they came and started interfering with the textbooks. And Zoya would recall, because she was chairing a committee which was set up under the CABE during the UPA 1, uh, soon after the UPA came to power, to how to deal with this problem of textbooks so that there is not that kind of government control over textbooks. Textbooks. Now, the government earlier with good intentions brought in good textbooks, but a new government could reverse it. So she, in fact, came up with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, research and everything with very good report, which suggested very concrete ways in which this could be done. How to remove institutions from direct control of government. I think we in universities also uh, are very aware of this, you know. If you have a good political uh, uh, people at the top, they make, make good appointments as vice chancellors. When a regime changes, <coughs> the whole thing changes. So should universities be so dependent one on that one person? Should vice chancellors exercise so much power that if they, for some reason, are not the right choices, then the whole institution can collapse? 
I think there are in public sector everywhere. I think there are many such questions, judiciary. I think we need to look very seriously at this relationship between the executive and other institutions, whether it is universities, NCRT, whether it is the courts, you know, how do judges get appointed? There are other models in the world, not perfect models. I don't think American model is a great model where, <clears throat> again, it's very political and it is a matter of chance as to where the balance is in the Supreme Court, you know. But there are, I mean, the other models and one can think of more. But I do agree with you that that's a very, very serious issue which we need to look at where we obviously did go wrong. Yeah. I mean, it's okay to say that the best of institutions can be spoiled if the people turn this way, as Ambedkar said, you know, no matter how good an institution you have, you... And yet, I think institutionally, there have to be safeguards inbuilt, you know, in which, which can prevent this or stave it off. Of course, ultimately, there is no answer but a greater consciousness, greater awareness, greater, you know, uh, a common sense in society about how these things have to function. But still, I think institutional level, it's a very serious issue which we need to address. And it requires serious thinking, research, identification, and uh, suggestions. It, it should be done. <clears throat> I think what Zoya said is very important. And in fact, there was the I was running out of town, I mean, running out of time at the end, but there was another little passage I wanted to re read, read out from Nehru's speech to the US Congress on the same visit. It was, uh, you know, uh, it was a state visit and he was invited to the Congress and to the House of Representatives separately. I mean, this was a fantastic trip. He made about six speeches to universities. Amazing. There's another one at Columbia University also, which is fantastic. He makes a speech to the UN General Assembly, apart from how many press conferences, all in a matter of two weeks or three weeks, you know, amazing uh, uh, interaction with the with the American public, academia, government, uh, at all levels. It's, it's a fascinating story. And everywhere he goes, I was so struck. Everywhere he goes, he talks about Gandhi. He never forgets to mention Gandhi and what he means. And in different contexts, he talks about different things. In the, in the U.S. Congress, in fact, he says, our foreign policy, uh, he says, well, he tries to explain it. And he says, look, look at the world. We are just coming out of the uh, complete destruction of the world through these two world wars. And surely we have to find a way out of it. It cannot be just more aggression that we can counter force only with the superior force. Even if it is there, your objective still has to be peace. And there he then goes back again and says Gandhi had something to offer. I think we as Indians have something to offer. It comes from our ancient past, but it's Gandhi who brought it to the fore. And then he goes on to explain uh, the, you know, what, what Gandhi's philosophy on that was. And how India's foreign policy is based on that, you know. So he does link it up with other things in other places. Again, I'm addressing Zoya's question. He links it up with the struggle for economic and social transformation within India. He never gives up the objective of what he calls socialism. You may or may not agree that he's fighting for socialism. And as you know, he, he defines it continuously and he says, that he purposely keeps a loose definition of socialism because he does not want it to be a rigid model. He doesn't want it to be a blueprint because it must evolve. What socialism will mean in each country must go on evolving. How you achieve socialism also has to go on evolving. And there again, he says the Gandhian method. In fact, in a... Uh, somewhere in the late 50s when he's explaining, he said there are two models how socialism can come. One is the Soviet model. He said, but that has violence, coercion. We don't want to follow that method. Gandhi had the same objective. We in India through Gandhi had the same objective, but the method is different. We must still continue to follow that method of reaching our goals, but the goal is of socialism. 
And what is socialism? Then, of course, he defines it, greater equality and gradual incremental movement towards socialism. So he does try very consciously to apply Gandhi to the challenges before India post-independence and in a creative way, not in a narrow way that you pick up. You know, I think this is where we go back to how the Gandhians have, in, in a sense, uh, uh, ruined Gandhi, you know, or the image of Gandhi. You just pick up a tenet, you say basic education and just go on and on about basic education. Or you pick up that he said that Hindi uh, should be, should have been, or the, you know, local language, mother language should be used. But you do it unthinkingly, you know, not looking at what's happening, what's the situation in which you are uh, talking about it. The Lohiites, for example, you know, they think they are great Gandhians and the only thing they will want to talk about is imposing Hindi on everyone. You know, is it possible in this country today to impose Hindi on India? And that too in the name of Gandhi. So I think uh, Gandhi creatively interpreted, I mean, Nehru creatively interpreted and adapted what he understood of Gandhi. Because you see, he did have any other model. Having let's 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 also talk about this a bit. Having given up the Marxist Soviet model of social and economic change to which he was committed earlier, he has the ideal, but he doesn't want to follow that method anymore. Seeing where it re reached, so he now more and more talks about means and ends. You cannot reach a good end with bad means, because the means then vitiate the end. And that he goes back to violence and how violence then vitiates what you achieve, the nature of the revolution, the suppression that occurs. Obviously, he's given a deep thought. You know, what has happened? Why the Soviet state became the way it did? Why it happened in other states also? So what is the democratic, in a sense, what Gramsci was doing for the European context? Nehru was doing in a different context. And almost at the same time. <clears throat> I think that's it. The last question, Nehru versus Gandhi dichotomy. It was a bit confused. Modernist, one modernist. Uh, my own understanding is that Gandhi was a modernist. Very much. Don't forget that he was totally committed to rationality. He said, I do not accept any religious precepts, any book, any scripture, unless I subject it to the test of rationality. And that, he said, goes for Hindu scriptures or for the Quran or for any other. He said that again and again. You know, he, he was totally committed and fought for a democratic, secular India. That's modernity. He was committed to the Karachi resolution of the Congress, which he helped Nehru draft, which is very clear as to what is the future India that the National Congress is fighting for. It's a completely modern, it is a model of the Indian constitution. There is nothing going back in it. There is no village republic in it. He had a utopian ideal, which he has every right to do. You have to, I don't have the time to explain it. One has to understand those aspects in a different framework. But that was not what he was fighting for as the leader of the Indian National Congress and as the leader of the Indian people. He had fads, vegetarianism, nature cure. He didn't ask the Indian people to all become vegetarian, did he? You know. Those were personal ideals for him and for his followers who wanted to follow him or ask him those questions. We constantly mix up these two. So I'll stop there. We are with us, Professor Anil Sadgopal. Uh, can you, Anil ji, please unmute yourself and. Anilji, not here. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Vijay Chandra has raised some question in the chat box. I will request him to share his question himself. Vijay. 
Um, yes, no, my question was simply, uh, you know, whether we could touch on uh, Panditji's uh, focus on scientific temper sure. and, uh, and uh, how, you know, in some sense that mission has been abandoned or or not, I think uh, I just wanted uh, Professor Mukherjee's views on that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you know, it is something I would have very much wanted to uh, talk about if there had, you know, been that kind of time. Uh, but uh, yes, I think uh, for, for Nehru, uh, scientific temper, which was, I think, again, something which... Uh, Uh, it was more than science, just science. Of course, he was very much committed to scientific research, scientific development. He believed that economic development uh, and progress could not happen without total commitment to science. And we know he developed all those institutions. But I think when we are talking about scientific temper, it went much beyond. It was a way of thinking, you know, where, uh, which he wanted to uh, spread to society at large. It was not meant only for scientists or for educated people. It was He wanted the whole of the society to develop a scientific way of thinking, where they evaluated things on the basis of it is a different way of saying rationality, but to informed also by not just a basic instinctive rationality, but by informed knowledge of what's also going on in the world of science, you know? And everything should be tested on the basis of that. So he was very, very committed to it and uh, talked about it all the time. And I think also it's a, it's a very interesting concept which he developed, you know? And of course, at the moment, it's also part of our constitution, uh, but we all know also what's going on. I mean, we are living in times where exact opposite of anything like scientific temper is advocated from the highest quarters. We hear about all kinds of discoveries which were made in ancient India, you know, about space and aeroplanes and plastic surgery and medicine and what have you, nuclear, uh, nuclear, nuclear tipped arrows, you know. So what is there to say? I mean, you know. You even have a situation where in the Indian Science Congress, people come and present papers which are, which have nothing to do with science, you know. And uh, all that is patronized and you have, uh, I mean, you know, I think the less said about it, the better. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I um, actually um, also just wanted to mention that I found the link to Pandiji's address in Chicago, and I put it in the chat. So okay. Oh, like wonderful. Sure. 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 Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Uh, we are with us, Professor Shekhar Ramakrishnan. I will request Shekhar to say a few words. Shekhar. Please. No, please. I. This is, you know, all a complete learning experience for me complete learning experience and the, th the things I learned today about, you know, what Nehru had done, especially in the early 40s, uh, you know, and his whole approach to democracy within the Congress party, you know, I found extremely um, illuminating. And uh, <clears throat> I just have one small thing which may not be relevant to this at all. I remember when Nehru passed away and we had a break and I, when I went home and I brought back a big picture of Nehru and I put it in my hostel room. And quite a few of my friends who were all, you know, educated in um, prep schools were quite surprised. Why would somebody have a picture of this man in his room? So I feel that somehow that whole attitude has combined with Hindutva in recent days so that, you know, I think I feel that the Hindutva has this strong ally in in people who felt that uh, somehow, you know, Nehru was not um, 
throw capital or you know whatever no i don't know i could be completely wrong on this it's just a very anecdotal experience with uh, some of my mm-hmm. upper class friends sorry capital supported them well that's not surprising because uh, uh, you know uh, the, the 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 business uh, groups as well as the princely uh, element did you know uh, come out strongly in support uh, of for example the swatantra party you know which had been making it was not a very powerful party it never had more than you know a uh, couple of uh, uh, you know maybe 15 20 seats ever but still at at a political level and in certain sections <clears throat> it was certainly nehru's uh, emphasis on planning and public sector and all that despite the fact that he was committed to a mixed economy but certainly uh, he was against any kind of complete uh, you know allowing complete freedom to the private sector to do what it liked so certainly and there was a fear always among certain sections that nehru's policies would uh, go against their interests you know as they well might if depending on what those interests were and uh, so they did uh, organize themselves and even as important a leader as rajagopal achari left you know so from in within congress also there were certainly elements who were very much against uh, nehru's socialist perspective who were against the idea of the public sector who believed in free enterprise who were uh, at the foreign policy level who, who wanted to ally with america you know so of course those elements were there and some of them broke away and did go into formations like and they were supported by by big money and feudal money so perhaps though that's what you are reflecting though the i must say that uh, the general uh, f- uh, sort of reaction at the time of nehru's death uh, in the country from whatever you know one knew of at that time as well as later accounts was one of uh, widespread popular uh sorrow which was expressed in many many ways publicly uh, where uh, you know people have put it down in their memoirs and all and recounted it as to how shocked they were and how uh, his death was seen as a very much a big loss you know and a very emotional moment for indians no Uh, no, I just wanted to say Hindutva has a big support in this, sure. Uh, sure. you know, pro big capital. Sorry. I'll... Right, 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 right. Yeah. Professor Jan Ray is also here with us. Uh, I would request him to share his comment. Jan. Yeah. Professor Jan Ray. Oh, Jan Ray. Oh. संघ परिवार हेट नेहरू बिकॉज इट फाइंड हिज लिबरल एंड सेक्युलर प्रिंसिपल मोर सेटनिंग दैन वॉट गांधी स्टूड फॉर by targeting nehru has bjp and co entered a decisive battle to promote itself as the champion of an alternative vision of indian civilization okay should i take that yeah please please sure well i don't think that uh, actually speaking that they have greater uh, problems with nehru than they have with gandhi let's not ever forget uh, why and by whom atma was uh, assassinated he was obviously seen as the biggest hurdle to the setting up of a hindu rashtra for the very simple reason 
that he also had the position that, you know, to argue that he was not uh, a good Hindu was very difficult. And he also had the support of the majority of the Hindus of that time. So he was obviously seen as the bigger hurdle who should be got rid of. And if you go back and just study some of the texts of uh, the Hindutva ideologues, whether you read Golwal Kurds, we or our nation would defined, or whether you go to Savarkar and uh, read his speeches. And certainly if you go to the more popular press of which was run by people like Apte and uh, Godse and all that with the support of uh, Savarkar, uh, Agrani, for example, a newspaper which they brought out. But even in the big ideologues, there is such a such a hatred of Gandhi and such sharp criticism of Gandhi right through from the big from the late thirties. You can find this in their writings, very very clear. So it was not as all as if they were. Uh, or they are, you know, think of Gandhi as somebody uh, who is more in line with their thinking and Nehru's. It's a question, I think, today, for as a government, and as people in power, it suits them to keep a facade of appropriating Gandhi. As you can see, whenever push comes to shove, do they ever take a stand? When Sadhvi Pragya said all that, praising Godse, all that the Prime Minister could say was, I will never forgive her in my heart. But the BJP till today has taken no action against her. Not even a show cause notice, perhaps. And she's a sitting member of parliament. Somebody who can idolize the assassin of the Mahatma, what is the message that is being sent? All the time in the social media and all, if you will see, on Gandhi's martyrdom day, January 30, what will be trending? And we know, we all know how this trending happens because it is the pushed by the bots, you know. What will be trending will be Godse's speech, why I killed Gandhi. And a whole lot of hate stuff on Gandhi. So it all goes on at that effective subterranean level. Where at the top, you will, uh, you know, go talk of Khadi, go to Sabarbati Ashram, take all the G20 to Rajghat, you know, Swachhata, uh, whatever, Swach. Swachandolan and whatever it is where Gandhi's glasses are there, you know. But what about following his ideals? Is there, it does anybody ever quote Gandhi on secularism? Do they quote him when he says that the, in my, the, the India of my dreams will be a homeland for everybody? And if, if in the, if in that India, Muslims do not feel equal. It will not be the India of my dreams. He says it repeatedly again and again and again and again. It's not hidden what his views were. They, at that time, he was supposed to be the biggest appeaser of Muslims. After all, it was he who offered Jinnah the Prime Ministership of India, didn't he? Do you think he was loved by the Hindutva forces for that? You know, he was the object of hate. You can see that. But you just read, as I said, Golwalkar and Savarkar speeches of that period and you will see it's crystal clear. Nehru doesn't even figure over there. Of course, Nehru figures later now because he was the Prime Minister of India. He did put the RSS, he banned the RSS, put them behind bars. You know, and it's obvious that his ideals have to be. And much more than anything else, it is also part of present day politics. 
because the Gandhi family is still important. Sonia Gandhi is still there, Rahul Gandhi is still there, Priyanka Gandhi is still there. It makes political sense for them to villain, uh, you know, demonize Nehru because he is the ancestor. When you say dynast, dynasty, you can't talk about dynasty unless you go back to Nehru. Because the dynasty comes from there. You see? So that's why the dynasty has to be attacked and Nehru has to be attacked. And of course, all that he stood for has to be attacked. Of course, they are against any, any form of public sector, socialism, economic equality, pro-poor, secularism, democracy. Of course, if all that is exact antithesis of the ideology of Hindutva. That's very much there. But don't let us for a moment imagine that when the time becomes uh, appropriate, who will be the open target of attack. Professor Raji, Raji Yudhin is also there and he, he has shared some question in the chat box. I will request him to unmute and share his question and comment. Raji sir. Eh? G, G. Ah, please, uh, please, please. Good. I have just a small uh, uh, I I, I couldn't figure it out uh, knowing so many socialists in the, um, of all brands. Why Nehru is so much missing from their conscience? If, if Nehru was by heart so socialist and for equity and for all these social reforms, and socialists also say that, and in fact, I name obviously. Loya and Jay Prakash, they really didn't like him. Not only these two, all the very smallest socialists or the very tallest. Why? So communists also didn't like him, although he was partly Marxist. Socialists also didn't like him, although he was <laughs> quite socialist. And obviously, the very uh, a lot of very uh, what you call. In Pakistan side also, I know that they say that, you know, he was very Muslim friendly and all that, but they hated him. Uh, I mean, why, what is all this? Why this man, is this because he was so tall that everybody just felt like, uh, was that the real psyche that everybody felt pygmy? I mean, I, I that is my question or whatever, Mridraji, if you want to. Well, you know, as you know, uh, for example, Jayaprakash Narayan, uh, let's yeah. take him, because he was, uh, as you know, he was a Congress socialist right from early 30s, worked very closely with Jawaharlal Nehru. Above all, he was a personal friend of uh, Jawaharlal Nehru. Tra Nehru treated him like a younger brother. In fact, they were so close that he addressed Nehru as bhai, you know. They were close at a family level, close at a uh, personal level, close at an ideological level. Nehru, in some ways, even saw him as a possible successor to himself. So Acharya Narendra Dev, he had great respect for Acharya Narendra Dev again. Somebody he was very close to. And uh, But you know the history of the what happened after independence. Before independence, the Congress socialists very much worked with Nehru. There is no, uh, he, in fact, they, 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 he, they had full support from him. He never joined the social, Congress Socialist Party. Because you see, this was, and this is the difference during the freedom struggle, and this becomes much more developed later. So I'll have to spend a couple of minutes explaining this. <clears throat> Congress Socialists formed the party, Congress Socialist Party, within the Congress as a group. Okay. Yes. So they were a party, and but there was still a party within the, within the Congress Party, and Congress Party allowed it. Communists were a party outside the Congress. Sometimes they collaborated with the Congress, sometimes they didn't collaborate with the Congress. But Congress Socialists, till 48, were a party within the Indian National Congress. All right. Yes. Yes. Now, so they had a relationship where they saw their 
job as to radicalize the Congress in a socialist direction. Jawaharlal Nehru also, as an individual, saw his job, apart from other things, as radicalizing, orienting the Congress gradually in a socialist direction. But he did not believe that he could do it better by joining the Congress Socialist Party because he believed that his position, his independent position, would be of greater help and help him to work with the others in the Congress Party because unlike, he also didn't see himself limited to just being a socialist. Right, in that sense, in the sense of a party. He was always a, also always a free uh, free soul in that sense. And now, but let's come to the, but they remain, they had a complete relationship of, uh, of uh, cooperation and friendliness till independence. Now in 1948, when he became the prime minister, now what the socialists wanted, in fact, they came up, they, made, they, they, they drew up a program of what needed to be done for to you know, to push India in a socialist direction. And they wanted Nehru to adopt that program for the Congress as the Prime Minister. Nehru's strategy was, and his understanding of the Indian situation was completely different. And how he had worked before independence also. That's why he did not support Subhash Bose at Tripuri. Because he did not believe that you should push the Congress so much that it breaks. His strategy was always to go on pushing the Congress in a socialist direction without breaking it and always carrying people along. In fact, he expounds this in the uh, 50s more and more and more and more clearly, where he says the socialism that has to come cannot be dictatorship of the proletariat. It cannot be socialism even of the 50%. It has to be socialism of the 90%. We have to convince the people and we have to convince people within the Congress to push them. Of course, some people may leave because as we go along. But basically what his, his understanding was that the con consensus within the society will only get reflected in the Congress. So what he said to the socialists was you mobilize more become more and more powerful within the party. They said, no, use your influence. Nehru was not willing to push. He would use his influence to a point, but not to a point where he would push so that Sadar Patel would leave the Congress. His understanding also of Sadar Patel, Rajinder Prasad, etc. was very different from that of the socialists. He did not see them as reactionaries. He saw them as conservative. He did not see them as pro-imperialist. They were freedom fighters, socially conservative, not reactionary. He did not believe that Patel was a stooge of the capitalists or Rajinder Prasad. They have certain views. Their views are different, but they are people who must be carried along to the extent possible. And certainly after independence, as you know, even he had a vision of a national government. He, though at Gandhiji's prompting, he brought brought Ambedkar into the cabinet. He brought Shama Prasad Mukherjee into the cabinet. As you can see, these are different models of functioning. Socialists were very unhappy with this. They said, no good. 1948, most of them left. Of, uh, one year later, many others left. So they developed a whole critique of Nehru, where, which obviously over time they developed, that they became rivals to Nehru. If you see some of the vituperative and then, as you know, they split and split and split, you know, like Amoeba into so many groups and rejoined and split and rejoined. So it was difficult to keep track of what was happening. And of course, the Lohiite wing became among the most powerful within that. And Lohia, as you know, became completely viciously anti-Nehru. And not only anti-Nehru, Lohia developed the whole theory of anti-Congressism. Not an ideological theory. This anti-Congressism. You know, now that's a long that's another time. But the communists, as you know, Nehru was always very friendly to the communists, did his best for them. I mean, there's no doubt he was very close to R.P. Dutt 
And I mean, you know, ideologically, he was very close to them. And even after independence, he helped, I mean, except in the Ranadive period where what could a government do if the Communist Party of India says it's in an insurrectionary mode and it's going to, with violence, fight the government. Naturally, as Prime Minister Nehru has to take action against them. He can't, as a Prime Minister, say, fine, go on with your rebellion, you know. I mean, once he's in government, he has to act as a government. But the moment they give up that line, he immediately rehabilitates them. They join, they, they fight in the first general elections and they do pretty well. They're the largest party, some 20 something seats, but that was the largest opposition party. You know, he doesn't suppress them. And he's always, he has a very kind of friendly, critical attitude towards them. Except he keeps hoping that they are going to see more. But they, they also are so vituperative because of their own theory. You know, they all imagine that after independence, suddenly socialism will come to India. That's not how Nehru sees it. I think I should stop here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think uh, with this note only, we should uh, conclude this meeting because... Very, very important discussion has taken place about Nehru. Many, many aspects of uh, Nehru's persona <coughs> have come out and the way in which he is being vilified by all these people, including a section of the socialists also, how they, how they have been targeting him. So all these aspects have come out beautifully. Uh, and uh, we, on behalf of uh, NSI, we would like to thank, thank uh, Professor Mugdila Mukherjee again because she accepted our invite uh, very for a short notice. Many, many thanks for coming coming here, Professor. And uh, uh, thanks to all the participants also who, who joined the discussion and who joined the conversation. We, we will meet next month. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.